The Vanier Twins are here! The Norse gods Freyr and Freya are available as enamel pins in our merch shop. They've got armor, they've got swords, they've got the best dang animal companions a deity could ask for, and they're available for a limited time. Link below. Hello everybody, welcome to another Detail Diatribe. I am Blue, and I'm joined by Red. I'm drinking tea. I don't know what's in it. I made tea. It's Harney and Sons Citron Green. Oh, cool. It's like Sencha with a little bit of lemon. It's pretty soothing. It's, it's good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we are here today to talk about why there will never be another Shadow of the Colossus. <laughs> the battle to figure out the thesis of this presentation. We're going to talk about, I, hopefully we We're remember there. <laughs> by the time we record the pod for this episode. Yeah, and yeah. we'll talk a little bit about that as we're getting uh, going. But yeah. first off, uh, what is this game? Well, you see, this is a game from 2005 made by Fumito Ueda and Team Eco, gorgeously remade in 2018 for the PlayStation 4 by Bluepoint Games, thanks to the magic of one generation backwards compatibility available on PS5, if Whoa. you're curious. From 2005, with lots and lots of love, we are fans of this game. <laughs> We've streamed this before. One of our first OSP animateds was a little Shadow of the Colossus animatic. That's uh, our, our good boy Dirge uh, over there. Dirge. Yeah, and our faces on that thumbnail are still pretty indicative of how we felt about that fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Shadow of the Colossus. I've liked this game for a long time because I didn't get the chance to play it for a long ass time. Mm. And I saw other people play it and I love their playthroughs. I liked the the soundtrack. Like the yeah. score for that is one of the first things I just had on, on file. Um, and when we played it, back in the day it was really fun but so harrowing and, absolutely yeah. and like that was i think one of the first games that we played on the channel so it was like yeah. we, we hadn't been like we weren't live streaming much at the time and i think we did live stream this one and so we were kind of like this is this is so fun but so harrowing and we were very worried about like am i being bad at game on stream <laughs> which as you all know now we don't give a shit <laughs> yeah no, no. <laughs> not not a, a single solitary f turns out it's actually funny to be bad at games on stream and exactly. if it's a bit we commit. Yep. Anyway. So on the subject of, of music, the reason <laughs> that we're doing this Detailed Diatribe is because last weekend we had the immense pleasure of going to uh, Symphony New Hampshire's Game Overture, which is a hilarious pun, yes. concert with a uh, special guest uh, conductor, Austin Wintery, <laughs> friend of the channel, friend of the show, close personal buddy. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Notable <laughs> fanboy magnet, Austin Wintery, <laughs> who I've heard about every day for the last three years because of how much I talk to Blue. Composer of Blue's favorite game, Journey. Which which does make an appearance much later on in this uh, presentation, because oh, of yeah. course it does. Oh, but yeah. we got to listen to a concert of all the hits of video game music, Pokemon, which Red was immediately just like right in the Smash Bros. stage yeah. when she heard it. I'm not a Pokemon girly, but I loved that stage of Smash Bros. It was a fun one where you got to hit people with more Pokeballs than usual. Yeah, and the audience cheers for you. That's fun. I keep forgetting how much I like live music. Yeah. You know, like I'm, I'm iPods and iPhones and, and just the YouTubes have spoiled me in this regard. Cause it's like, I can just look this up and listen to it on headphones and it's pretty good. And then when you're in it, you're like, oh, fuck. how is this just making me experience emotions? <laughs> what the sh yeah. So that was where we were at. And it, like immediately, like we're in it to win it with Pokemon right from the jump. Yeah, it was a fantastic opening number. And then uh, approximately in order, we had Uncharted, which of course is a favorite of mine. And hearing that with, uh, they did the Nate's theme 2.0 and the music was was so, what I felt when I was in the, the seats at that that concert was this music is so lush I want to swim in it uh, it yeah. was just so much the room was thick with it it was such a unique feeling that I not going to that many cl uh, classical music concerts or you know orchestral performances live uh -huh. I don't get to feel all that often so this was a treat but I then of course the hits kept coming we got Zelda journey conducted by Austin Wintry uh, nascence and uh, apotheosis uh, he also performed one winged angel which fucking ruled. That was an experience and a half. They, they had like a like a high school choir performing all of the vocal parts yeah. for all these various songs. And I think they probably had the most fun on One Winged Angel. Oh yeah. It had words and stuff. I don't know what Latin. they were, but yeah. Sephiroth. Yeah, dun, 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 we don't know what's going dun, 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 on until we hit Sephiroth. the Sephiroth. Yeah. 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 And of course, when the bell kicks in, it's like, oh, you're fucked, kiddo. My favorite part of One Winged Angel is the chunk in the middle that randomly sounds like it's scoring a Tom and Jerry chase scene. <laughs> <laughs> Cloud gets transmuted into a little mouse and runs around. While Sephiroth. Sephiroth has like a giant, it's the katana, but it has a rubber mallet on yes. the end of it. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Fan art desk Monday. Yeah. 
And then uh, after a brief intermission, we had Mass Effect Super Mario, which was just so like jaunty and cute. Like all these other ones were sweeping, beautiful renditions. And Mario was just like, dude, 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 yep. dude. It was, it was very, very sweet. By way of the Muppet Show opening orchestration, Pretty basically. Much. Uh, of course, then also Prince of Persia 2008, the dark horse choice for this performance, but I think it was a really great addition. I wouldn't have picked it, but I'm glad they did. Yeah, I liked it. A lot uh, of minor progressions. Yeah, and then uh, they ended with uh, with Halo, which was just fantastic to hear when the kids were just going nuts on the chorus and that. It was amazing. I want to shout out the one kid who did the solo vocals at the Yeah! Because, like, this was the final performance. I've done, like, musical performances as, like, a middle schooler. It is so stressful when there's an actual audience and you have to get all dressed up nice. And the idea of being the soloist for the last number, like, that's hanging over your head the entire time. So oh, I wanted, yeah. I want to shout out that kid. Did a great job. <laughs> Hope the anxiety wasn't too bad. <laughs> yes, uh, they. everyone did fantastic. The kids, the, the musicians uh, in the orchestra, the conductors both did great. And, uh, of course, uh, the reason that we're here today is because one of the songs, <laughs> or one of the games that had music played in the second act was Shadow of the Colossus, mm -hmm. which... All of these performances were exquisite, but when they started playing the prologue music for Shadow of the Colossus, I felt something yeah. that wouldn't rest until this video was done. <laughs> I think it, it was a little bit strange because all of these were, of course, uh, adaptations of, you know, music that isn't necessarily written for an orchestra, especially Mario, where mm -hmm. it's like, that's no. a chip tune. And they were like, we're going to make this a little bit jazzy, you know, because we yeah. kind of have to make it swing a little bit. Listening to like the Zelda, like the original Zelda theme played by an orchestra was a lot of fun. It yeah. really had that vibe. I think the Shadow of the Colossus one sounded the most like it does in the game. It was, it was note for note perfect. Right. And that made me feel a lot more like I was in it. The yeah. only difference is, so they, they started with, I think it's called Silence. Or... Um, I was wrong. It's ah. just called Prologue. Okay. That makes sense. And I think I might've been wrong about what they transitioned into. I thought it was a violent encounter. It's the opened way. Right. So we were both wrong. Right. Well, <laughs> look, I've listened to the songs a lot, but I listened to them in those big compilations. Exactly. So it was the opened way, which is what plays when you start kicking ass. Yeah. Kind of. The only difference was that they had it slowed down just a little bit yeah other than that note for note and like the the opening of the game plays this very like ethereal woodwind thing kicks you're, in the choir you're gonna hear it now it's in the background oh good 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 yeah uh and like hearing that live kind of surrounding you was a, a very interesting like immersive experience i was like this ch chill beats to slay colossi too yeah. I, I don't know how to explain it it, it was very I mean, it's hard to explain the effect of live music. I've never been convinced about it until I, you know, went. And I was like, I don't, yeah, I guess this was really good. <laughs> yeah. For me, um, of course, having listened to the soundtracks for, for a lot of these games a lot, and especially Journey, which of all these ones here I've listened to the most, obviously. Really? When That's they played it, I was like, huh, the mix is a little different. And I'm like, that's live music, you dumbass. Of course, <laughs> the instruments sound different on a stage than in a yeah. recording booth. But for Shadow of the Colossus, it, it truly did sound note for note exactly like it was in game there were instruments that i thought would be quiet or live that hit just as loud as they did on the original recording mm -hmm. and in the case of the choice to slow the opened way down it weirdly had the effect of feeling like it did in the game yeah even though in the game it's faster it felt like you were on this this huge lumbering colossus as it's moving mm -hmm. it was a weird choice i can't explain exactly why it worked but it felt truer to life or it felt truer to the experience of the game because they made that conscious choice to slow it down yeah it, it, it this is a little bit of a tangent it just <laughs> it was so so fun to be in that space listening to that music feeling all the emotions that the, the themes from these games draw out and naturally i could not rest uh, until this became a video so so yeah. let's continue on um, we <laughs> went home uh, the following day uh, and played it immediately. Yep. And it was a bit of a trial. It was a little difficile to settle <laughs> on a thesis. We were playing through the whole game front to back over the course of like Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And notably, we hadn't finished the game before. Like yeah, I knew how it ended, yeah. but when we played it before, we didn't get to the last Colossus. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I knew how the game ended, but I never seen it all the way through. We got a bunch of achievements for it. Um, we got a bunch of achievements in the end. So we're like, okay, what's the thesis? Is it like, oh, is it that it does this thing really well? Is it a tone thing? Is it the music? And we're kind of coming to all these points of like, it's this feels like either something someone said before, or it's like, okay, that's the thesis, and the whole detailed diatribe is essentially three sentences long. Yeah. Okay. It's hard to talk about a good thing. 
we eventually, partway through, after a couple frustrating boss encounters in the mid-game, we <laughs> did end up finding our thesis. And that, of course, is what you saw at the beginning of the slideshow, that mm -hmm. there will never be another Shadow of the Colossus, and we will go through the game to explain quite why that is, going through some of the things that work, some of the reasons uh, that maybe it, it doesn't work as well as we might hope, um, and then getting into what other games have done, how they've tried to adapt the ideas and the feeling and the mechanics of Shadow of the Colossus, where they've succeeded, where they failed, and what that means for, for video games going forward. Mm -hmm. so, and this is a challenge. I want there to be another Shadow of the Colossus. Yes. Thus far, there has never been. Yeah. Perhaps there never will be. P prove me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is simple. Uh, you are Wander, a... Well, you are nameless protagonist. Wander is only... You know Nobody what? gets named. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. You are hero boy. <laughs> a hero. You are redacted. <laughs> <laughs> you are a blank slate, playing yeah. out a very classic hero's journey. You're saving a girl. She's dead. What's your relationship with her? Never specify. Yeah. It's a very simple <laughs> archetype. Team Eco loves doing this. They found her on the side of the road. Yeah. <laughs> Could be anyone. The uh, Team Eco did this with uh, with their first game, Eco, as well, where they were like, "We want to build a, a game that's entirely based on the premise boy meets girl, basically." Yeah. And they did. It's boy girl. I think they have names in that game, but in this uh, one, <laughs> Team Eco. I don't know. <laughs> Team Eco has a habit of making their protagonists nameless and not very strong, like, not very, like, mm, strongly shown off in the characterization department. Yeah. They clearly have whole lives and personalities, but we only ever see a little bit of them. Uh, to that point, I guess half of this, uh, this <laughs> crawl here is actually, uh, not even true. Agro has a name, though. Agro has a name. <laughs> we know Agro. Dorman has a name. Uh, Mono is, uh, implied. Uh, yep. <laughs> so... You are tasked with this, uh, with this mysterious spirit that's definitely not a demon. Super Dorman. not evil. Yeah, absolutely not. Good guy, Dorman. Um, <laughs> unfairly canceled by the woke mob, Dorman. Uh, to slay 16 fearsome colossi scattered across the forbidden lands to cast a spell and revive your dead, maybe, girlfriend? Eh? Could be anyone. Found her on the side of the road. <laughs> yep. Uh, and the only other person is your horse, Agro. Good horse. Good horse. Good horse. Sure, if nothing bad happens to him. This is all the game tells you outright, and as Red points out, not even! The mm -hmm. game doesn't even tell you all that outright. No. We're making some leaps based on what's in the credits. Yep. Uh, but everything else that you will figure out about the game is organically discovered by you, the player, through subtle environmental storytelling and what theorizing you do in your free time afterwards. Mm -hmm. There is very little that is surfaced to you. There is so much here, but it is not presented clearly or obviously for the sake of the player understanding it. If you go through the world as a big old dumbass, not having a clue what's going on, that's maybe the most in Wander's head you could possibly be. <laughs> it's it's like the experience of playing The Legend of Zelda, but you are as clueless as Link is. Yeah. It's like you wake up in Hyrule and Breath of the Wild, and you also have no f idea what you're looking at. <laughs> but what's interesting is that Wander is specifically a profoundly incurious protagonist. He has no yeah. follow-up questions. Dorman no. is like, uh, I can revive this girl, but you must slay these colossi, uh, and the price you pay might be strong. And Wander's like, bet. All right, All right let's go. <laughs> and when he says bet, the choir kicks in yeah. evilly. <laughs> he literally just couldn't care less. He's like, what? clearly, whatever his relationship is with nameless girl, He's extremely, like, any cost is worth it. So so that tells us everything we need to know about Wander. Whatever happens, he doesn't care if he's doing something good or evil. He doesn't need to be told any secondary things like the Colossi are terrorizing the land or whatever, like, cleanse the world. Like, none of these... No. Yeah. Let's just go kill them. <laughs> just go kill them so I can bring this girl back from the dead. What's your relationship to her? What implied happy ending would you have with her? We never know. It doesn't matter to Wander. It doesn't matter to us. It is a video game. We signed up to play it. The game doesn't need to convince us why we need to do the video game. He is a boy. She's a dead girl. <laughs> Can I make it any more obvious? <laughs> He has a sword. She's super dead. <laughs> That's kind of all we got. <laughs> Not a single thought in his head. Hey <laughs> that didn't scan, but oh well. No, it didn't. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, of course, uh, first thing we got to talk about is how the music of this game hits you like a colossus. Mm. It's like a, a freight truck tied to a boat 
tied to a Megaton Warhead is about how hard this music hits when you're in the moment. There are obviously a lot of great soundtracks out there. We know we heard several of them live last weekend. Your close personal friend composed at least one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my close personal friend Austin Wintry has composed several. Um, but Shadow of the Colossus is truly an all-time classic because it is one of the games where it does not just have great music, but like your Zeldas, like your Journeys, it's one of the games where the music is, is so truly front and center. And we're lucky enough to see a lot of that nowadays, but back beforehand, it wasn't really like that. I guess, you know, like Mario is kind of like that, where the music mm -hmm. is front and center, but not as much for an emotional gut punch as like, this is fun music. Like, okay, cool. Um, Shadow of the Colossus is an all-time classic where even as a casual player, even if you don't really know what you're listening to, you know you're feeling something. You don't need to have a complex musical education to understand, oh, this is, this is big sh this is this is grande music here. <laughs> the Shadow of the Colossus soundtrack is really good at specifically matching the tone of each boss fight. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, I think it's A Messenger From Behind is for the Dirge boss yeah. fight. And you can listen to that in isolation and be like, something's chasing me. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, the, whenever you're doing a chase, like they use a lot of like rapid high low jumps. This is just kind of like mm -hmm. musical shorthand uh, in the same way that you often build tension by going like up and down the scale, that kind of thing. We don't really have the language to discuss music no. on this level of like complex you know, uh, specificity, but the music in Shadow of the Colossus, there are so many tracks because every fight kind of feels different. Like, the yeah. first few, I think, are scored generally the same. There's, like, a track they play when you enter the area where the Colossus is in, yeah. but the Colossus isn't there yet, and it's just this little sting, and usually, the time it takes you to get from there to the actual boss arena, the music kind of stops playing, and you're left silent. It goes back talking. to silent. There's no overworld music. It doesn't None. play music when you are just traveling around. It's just ambient sound. There's a, a fairly standard, like the opened way is the one that they play in a few different fights where it's like, yeah. you figured it out, you're kicking its ass. Yeah. The one thing that's the same every time is the music that plays when a Colossus dies. Yeah. It's this sort of like tragic choral, uh, it's got this sort of like uplifting sound, but yeah. it's it's it kind of feels melancholy. It doesn't feel like a triumphant, you did it, you killed the beast. Yeah. It feels like, ah, uh, well, you know, this thing was kicking my ass 0.5 seconds ago, but now I feel a little bad. It's an immediate tonal rug pull from you're the hero, you're you're kicking ass to, oh uh, wait, no, that was a creature with maybe some thoughts and feelings. <laughs> wow. And the the music is always elevating the intended emotion of the sequence. So mm -hmm. in the calm sections, especially in the beginning uh, cutscene, that the game insists on playing every time every you time boot you up, open the which game. honestly is great. That's that that's fantastic. Uh, yeah. There's all these plucked strings, flutes, church organs, and choirs to create this very holy sounding sacred musical space with just this little bit of, of eeriness. There's this edge, this sinister undercurrent to it to kind of imply this corruption where there's the aesthetics of a holy space. You're, you're in a church, but there's- You're talking to a sunbeam. You're, you're talking to a sunbeam, uh, getting orders to slay giant beasts, but it's like there's something wrong here. Yeah. The, the, the world, like you said, Red, is quiet. When you get to the Colossus arenas, there's this kind of like, sinister, like, tepidation of like, what, oh boy, yeah. what am I feeling here? This is a little confusing, I don't know what's going on. And usually when you when you get into an arena, the Colossus is just kind of hanging out there, and it's only when you well, start an acting vibe, not always. Um, <laughs> Sometimes they bust open a wall, and then when you come out of the cutscene, you're five feet in front of it, and you need to sprint, but yeah. that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when you start stabbing it, you really get the triumphant music of like, all right, go, go, You're go. You're doing it. Yeah. You're doing it. But also, the very first thing you learn in the game is that the place you are is called the Forbidden Lands. Yeah. The part, one of the only pieces of information you get in this game is that you're not supposed to be here. Yeah. Like, says who? Doesn't matter. <laughs> you're not supposed to be here. Everyone. <laughs> and this mysterious voice you're talking to isn't like trying to come across as like, yes, hello, I am benevolent. It's like, <laughs> a challenger approaches? How interesting. Yeah. You're like... This guy's probably fine, but yeah. um, when uh, Shadow of the Colossus is one of the games that gets held up as evidence that games are art, which is apparently a thing people are still yelling about, even yeah. though obviously games are art, um, but one of the main pieces of the game that gets held up for that specific argument is the soundtrack, which is absolutely just like an orchestral suite like the kind you would have gotten in like the fancy parts of the 1800s, you know? Yeah, uh, you when they were still doing like thematic symphonies, like the yeah. planets. Yeah, yeah, the yeah planets yeah. or like the the four seasons. It's like like that level, but it's all about like what would it be like if you were fighting this kind of skyscraper? Yeah, um, and it's it's really good. the The soundtrack 
has not been changed at all when they remastered the game. Yeah. I don't even know if they re-recorded it. It's... I would imagine just to get better sound better quality, sound maybe, quality. But, but, but compositionally, tell. it's identical. It's yeah. identical, yeah. Uh, yeah. Games as art, yes. But in this specific case, it's like, this feels like you are, like, playing your way through, like... A painting, like yeah. the course of empires or something. Yeah. Basically, yeah. And, and the music is is so tied to the emotions that you are experiencing at each part of the game. Whether you are in this this unease of figuring out what you're going to do next, whether you're coming to the lair of this beast, uh, whether you're getting chased by it, mm -hmm. or whether you're on top of it stabbing it, or when you finally kill it and it plays this this funerary lament, this dirge of sadness. Uh, with with strings and uh, this big chorus, mm -hmm. and you're always feeling the exact emotion that the game wants you to feel, and it is heightened by the music, which is part of why the music stands on its own so well, and immediately brings you back to the feelings you would have in the game, which is why I felt so struck by it when we were sitting in the audience, mm -hmm. listening to the prologue and then the open way. It's like, I am there. It's been like five years since I played this game, but I am immediately back there because the music, like you often said, Red, is the the quickest shorthand to just put emotions yep. in a person. Yeah. I, I've uh, held the opinion for a while that every art form has one thing that it is superlative at. Like, prose writing is the best art form for telling you exactly what a p character is thinking. Mm -hmm. Any visual medium has to use shortcuts <laughs> and inference, but uh, prose writing, you can just tell me. And I think that, uh, like, animation is the best for getting across absolute freedom of movement. Um, you know, you want to know exactly how a thing is moving? You have to animate it. You know, yeah. live action has limitations is why no that's a separate rant <laughs> uh, yeah. but music is like a direct shortcut into the feelings center of the brain music yeah. can make you feel anything and it's the job of a composer to figure out how to hack that yeah. to make you feel exactly what they need you to feel and shadow of the colossus was composed extremely well for that Exactly. Mm -hmm. And when you are someone who's played the game and then is hearing it, you can immediately put yourself back in it because the tone in this game is so striking and so singular. You can conjure this image and that's <laughs> the tone of the game. Yeah. There's a monster taller than a mountain, veiled in fog, casting shadows because it's so huge. The atmospheric perspective in this game is mwah. And you've got to go kill it. Yep. The, the tone is immediate, it's obvious, it is so strong in every frame of the game as you are progressing through it, that whenever you hear the music, you immediately are put back into the tone. If you've seen this game, if you've played this game, you will immediately go right back there. And it's so striking because it's so consistent. There's there's no need for, for words, there's no extra faff. The music, the visuals, and the game mechanics are all completely aligned on this idea. And it sticks so clearly in your head, as opposed to, for instance, a more complex game with a lot of stuff going on that you can remember a lot of different things about and think happy thoughts of, but when you think of the game, your mind goes to like six different places. With Shadow of the Colossus, it's always this. Yeah, because a lot of games have a lot more going on. Yeah. We're gonna be bringing up Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom later in the slideshow, yeah. I, I assume. Yes. <laughs> uh, and those are games where it's like, my my favorite thing about them and my primary complaint, so much game in this game. And when I think about Tears yeah. of the Kingdom, I focus in on the, the specific core plot, finding Zelda, what happened to Zelda, how do we save Zelda? Because uh, that was what really hooked me in. Um, so all the music about that is really strong in my mind. But there's scores in that game that I cannot call up. Like, everyone loves the Colgara boss theme. I can't remember the other boss themes. Yeah, not as I strong. I haven't listened through them as much. And most of the reason we remember the Colgara boss theme is because they used it before in Dragon Roost. Well, <laughs> yes, but the thing is, I am a huge sucker for epic orchestral remixes of things I already know. Yeah. And the Colgara theme, basically bringing the like the the Rito Village theme, is always played on like high little woodwinds, nice little chill vibe setting, and then you bring in the entire chorus. Yeah. Like if you look through, it the, is good. It's it is so good. good. You look yeah. at the videos of it, and people are like. I hear that and I envision like the souls of countless generations of Rito warriors cheering Tulin on and I'm like, well, fuck, now that's what I'm thinking too. <laughs> Christ. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Music makes you feel sh <laughs> Every time the Game Awards is not something that interests me, but I always watch back through the like the medley they do. Yeah. Where, it's and, the best part. And the year that they had like Doom and Hades and then Animal Crossing. Yeah. And we get the so No, but like we get the Animal Crossing theme on a full orchestra. Yeah. It fucking brings it tears to my eyes. It was great. Like you get through the really like down, dirty, like dark, 
doom music. Da 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 an absolutely stellar job um, mm -hmm. back then, and then re-performed for the the 2018 remake. Uh, it's so it's just so goddamn good. Shadow of the Colossus is a game without an ounce of fat on it. It is no. entirely vibes and boss fights. And we will we will get to that a little bit more later. Good. But following on the tone, we talked about this a little bit, but really exploring it a little more. The the tone of this game is unease and unholiness mm -hmm. on absolute overdrive there's this decay there's this corruption and you are you are seeing it you are fighting it and you are also partially responsible for it because <laughs> killing the colossi is uh, bad for the ecosystem let's put it that way which is interesting because you'd be forgiven for not putting that together yeah in the sense that like like you know oh forbidden lands yeah hero sword dead girl it's like anytime the plot of a of a story is i'm gonna try and bring my dead friend back to life frequently the undercurrent is i don't know baby girl i think maybe you shouldn't <laughs> be doing that <laughs> like like sometimes sometimes it works out but it's a rare story that actually lets you bring your loved one back from the dead with no consequences yeah um and i i think that the way that this game plays it the fact that you have no information the fact that the game and dormant does nothing to try and convince you like this is a good thing to do it's just like just you <laughs> want this here's the price yeah do this scary thing and it's like okay cool i guess that's what i'm doing and the thing is like format wise this is extremely similar to a lot of classic early fantasy video games most notably zelda it's mm -hmm. like wander and link have similar levels of blank slatedness it's like what's up you are an anime boy here is a sword. There's a girl you want to save. Go out into the world and vanquish these scary things. Yeah. That is the same thing, basically. But this ties into a thing that I've, I've discussed on my end, which is that uh, a tragedy is all about context. Yep. And the protagonist of a tragedy who undergoes a horrifying downfall, usually due to their own flaws, those flaws would be good things in other contexts. Wander's selfless determination to do this thing is a heroic quality in a context where his selfless determination doesn't lead him to do this. Yeah, exactly. You, there, there are the raw aesthetics of heroic action, where you are, you are an underdog. You are the the David fighting these Goliaths. And a lot of these colossi are mean. Yeah, <laughs> we'll yeah. Some of that. these are bastards. <laughs> it's it's the implications, the rough outline of a hero's journey. Mm -hmm but it's just wrong. It's the idea of this holiness. You're talking with a, a god ray in a church above mm -hmm. you with choral music in the background, but it's it's evil. It's fucked up. Yep. It's the aesthetics of things that like on the surface, if you just like take it at absolute face value, like, yeah, no, this is great. How could how could Dorman be bad? Mm -hmm. How ever could this uh this this forbidden creature uh of, of shadow and light possibly be evil? Yep. But then in context, in this world, in these forbidden lands, it is all kinds of messed up and yep. Wander is on a perverted, sick, evil version of a hero's journey which sets the stage up for the tragedy. Yeah. The micro-tragedies of each colossus that you're killing and the macro-tragedy of uh, eventually, when you get all 16, mm -hmm. doing bigger crime. <laughs> I would be curious how this game plays to somebody who hasn't already, like, learned how the game goes. Because yeah. I think, you know, we know from the from the jump, like, here's how it's gonna end. So for us, it's like, red flag, red flag, red flag. But I wonder if anybody played this game like, what do you mean I'm bad? Yeah. What do you mean this was a bad thing? Yeah. I think the first time you kill a colossus and it barfs out these black snakes and they just slurp into you and knock you the f*** out and then Dormant is like, Anyway, <laughs> thy next foe, and it's like, oh, this might, mm, uh, this might, is this bad? This might be bad. This yeah. feels bad, but what am I gonna do? Not play the video game? Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, it's a good tone. It works <laughs> very well. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm saying it. This is the best open world in games. Be mad. I don't care. <laughs> this world comments. is monumental. It is gorgeous. It is forbidding at once lush and barren. It is so strikingly beautiful beyond any other open world I've ever seen in a game. And it is dead simple. And that is so much of the beauty of it. You do not have any kind of side quests or faff. 
the only two kinds of collectibles you can find, I mean three if you count save points, and those are pretty <laughs> sparsely scattered. There are lizards you can get for extra stamina, which you don't are, even need. But they're annoying, too. They're, they're annoying. Uh, there are coins you can get in only the remake, which give you a special little bonus as a nod to the, the search for the last great secret, which is an excellent Jacob Geller video, mm -hmm. talking about how the original players in 2005 and onward thought there, there has to be something else. So in making the remake, Blue Point Games thought, you know what? Let's make a something else. Let's, mm -hmm. let's scatter these all around the world so you can find them. And you can go the entire game without having to touch it. So this is an absolute no fat open world. There is no music. You just traverse it and it get to experience the scenery. All that you are having to guide you is the light from your sword. It's a very tactile sense of navigation where you don't have a waypoint, you don't have a compass, you don't have a mini map. You just mm -hmm. pull up your sword and follow the light. And the it's very effective. There is a map but it usually fog of wars over where you're trying to go. Yeah. So it's like, why even? <laughs> you can on. maybe process of elimination where you're going. Yeah. But it is it is so strikingly gorgeous. And when you are traveling, the camera will often frame you in the rule of thirds down in the corner so that the world in front of you can be big and imposing and dramatic. And it always looks so gorgeous. I don't know what magic they did <laughs> to get the camera to move in the ways that it does. But usually when you're traveling a world you're dealing with, Horse stamina, you're yeah. always looking on a, a straight path that you are following. The camera's right tied to the horse's ass with you right in the middle of the screen obscuring most of the world. I was going to say, you're mostly not in the center of the, sc the yeah. screen. And the camera in this game fights you about it. Like, yeah. if you try and center yourself to be like, I want to see what's going on, it's like, that's cute. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> let a professional handle this, kiddo. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The first day we played this, I made myself motion sick. Yeah. <laughs> I had to, like, recover. <laughs> the camera was trying to kill me. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. The and, game's good. And, and the horse aggro is a little difficult to control, but when you have these huge open spaces, you kind of get to feel like aggro is a real being with... With his own, uh, with, is Agro a she? I don't really remember. With no Agro's idea. own idea of, of where to go in any given Agro's situation. Agro. The thing Agro, about Agro yeah. is that... Uh, Agro's pronouns are Shadow the Hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing about Agro is that they're hard to control, but when you get them going, you kind of don't need to control them. It'll path yeah. for the most part yeah. in the correct ways. And it, it works really well, because like you can just kind of mash triangle until it's going top speed, and then... If you come to a crossing, you can pick which direction they go, and then after that, it's fine. And the only, even, like, in some of the fights, you need to be on aggro. And, like, the Dirge fight, you cannot survive no. if you are not on aggro. But you can just kind of mash triangle, and aggro is decent enough at pathing that it'll run you around the outside of yep. the arena and generally not smack you into any pillars. And you can focus on doing your horseback archery, which is how you have to win that fight. It really does feel like you're a team, that yeah. you are each taking a different process of like, mm -hmm. okay, aggro, let's move, and I will worry about the shooting. Again, Team Eco is really fond of giving you characters that you need to either rely on or help out who you cannot directly control. Uh, this is one of the things that they experimented with in every single one of their games. When in Eco, you're, it's basically an, an escort quest, mm -hmm. uh, but also like your character is indestructible. Like you're not in danger. You just need to protect and save yeah. uh, the the girl that you're trying to help. And in this one, you've got Aggro and of course the Colossus AI, uh, which is its own kind of thing. And then in Last Guardian, uh, which was their their last game, the entire conceit of the game is that the character you're controlling is almost completely helpless, uh, but can give directions <laughs> to the giant bird cat thing, Trico. which yeah, which doesn't really listen to you all that much, no. especially not early on. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, but the, but Team Eco loves doing that. Yeah, the the world of this game is is really something else because it's it's so much of a commitment to design the world in the right way with no compromises to give you this sense of, of pushing through uh, a desolate, decaying world, much more so than the, the, the junk you see in like, oh, this is a desolate, decaying world in Dark Souls. Yeah, there's shit everywhere. This is truly empty. We're dunking on Dark Souls? <laughs> yeah, why not? Oh, God. <laughs> no, Dark Souls is beautiful, but it is in service of a different experience when you're going through that world. This is going for something very specific, where the only thing that exists in this world anymore are the Colossi, and you are going to track them down and kill them. Mm -hmm. The sense of loneliness is so striking, where there are these huge vistas between 
major landmarks. There are deserts, there are fields, there are cliff sides, and the cliff, the, the cliff tech, uh, <laughs> the the rocks in this game look better than photorealistic. Yep. Still, the grass uh, a little the bit grass wonky. Grass is fine unless it, you're looking it, at it from a It's distance. fine. Yeah, the the game looks much better the lower to the ground the uh, the camera is. Uh, I I once tried to get up on a structure to look out, and I started to notice where the the, 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 the textures, textures start to repeat, yeah. which is like. That's a game from 2018. That's okay. That's, I, I, know, I know it's not perfect. But when the game is is in the the mode that it wants you to be in, which is is going through on horseback, exploring, just having the time on the horse to soak in each of these vistas as you cross them, waterfalls, ravines, bridges, structures that are in various states of, of collapse. Mm -hmm. It is so strikingly beautiful beyond anything else I've seen in any open world. Yeah. And it's small enough that you can actually kind of remember all of it without having to rely on these, you know, navigational aids or really needing fast travel to get across. Like, it could be helpful, but the world is small enough that it is designed specifically for the experience that you have going to each Colossus, mm -hmm. and that's it. It is not trying to do anything else. It doesn't do anything else. It is perfectly designed for that intended experience. The only quote-unquote fast travel happens after you beat the boss and Dorman warps you back into the, yeah. the temple thing. Dorman sends a little hawk to pick you up and <laughs> drop you back. And... The Koroks just hoist you up and carry you back. <laughs> yeah. And... <laughs> exactly. Toss you like a caber. But oh, with all that boy. said, we have to talk about the Colossi. Oh. Holy sh**. Gang, the Colossi. Big yikes. <laughs> They're incredible. Each one is lovingly designed, completely unique, a, a masterpiece of character <laughs> animation in its own right, and there are 16 of them. They absolutely steal the show. If they were not as good as they are, this whole game would have fallen apart. Mm -hmm. They are ranging from the the most obvious kinds of designs of it's 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 a big guy with a club to the weirdest things that you could think of and it's so well done each of them are perfectly matched to the arenas that you find them in they they have their own personalities and characteristics to them some of them are very timid some of them will attack you absolutely the fuck on sight mm -hmm. uh like this tall guy on the right here uh malice from the very end of the game he, he is pissed he always knows where you are it, it's honestly we can put some footage in because yeah. fighting him was real interesting. Uh, because basically, as soon as you get there, like you see him, and of course, if you can see him, he can see you. And he's got these like glowing bands of light on his arms, and he just raises one hand yep. and just points it at you. He doesn't do anything until you climb this last little thing of stairs and, and step in the arena, and then he shoots you with a laser. <laughs> and then if you get KO'd and you're still in the arena, he shoots you with a laser again. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you get caught once, he will just push you off the side of the map. Yeah, there he's, are a few Colossi that we'll get there. We'll get yeah, there. We'll, oh, we'll get there. <laughs> one interesting thing about the Colossi is that you don't beat any two of them quite the same way. No. Like, they all have the same general structure. They have weak points on their bodies. Uh, some of them are, like, minor weak points that might uh, make them drop something or, or weaken them in some way so that you can access their real weak point. And then you just stab the shit out of it. Uh, until it explodes in a nice slow-mo. They, they do this great thing where on the last strike, everything goes slow motion and the music cuts out. Yeah. So you always know, oh, I did it, I did it, great. And it immediately changes the tone. Yeah. But like, some of these bad boys are like, you can't get near it because it's like zappy or this one's flying. You need to find a way to either bring it down so you can get on top of it or make it try to attack you so you can jump on it. Uh, some of them have armor plating and you're like, I don't think I can attack, I can't see its weak point. I probably need to find a way to break that. Um, some of them you need to climb on top of, some of them you can't reach their legs, uh, but no two of them are quite the same. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I think they did a really good job of kind of iterating on this formula, but at the same time, you kind of start learning to know what, like, what to look for. Yeah. Like, where are the patches of fur that I can climb? Which of the parts of their bodies that are stone can I actually grab onto? because the, the language of the game is not always the clearest about what rock things are grabbable and what are not. Yeah. Eventually you get a sense for it. You can kind of feel it before you can actually tell it consciously. You you intuit it. And uh, these colossi appear as, you know, kind of a tangled hulk of, of fur and stone. It's unclear whether they were built or grown or cultivated or what. They have this this architectural structural quality to them where mm -hmm. they are they are not just creatures. They're they're truly something else, yeah. which is so unique of a visual and uh, and an aesthetic and tonal identity for them, where they are parts of the world 
that that defy the rules of how creatures usually work. Yeah. And even the three of them that are kind of similar, the three minotaurs as they're called in the uh, yeah. in the game files, the fights that they have are completely different in terms of how you engage with them. The first one is the simplest, but there's there's Barbus, the, the second one where you have to kind of jump on his beard and crawl yep. around him that way, and the arena is completely different to accommodate that, and then the 15th Colossus is also a completely different kind of fight that uses the arena in a different way. So it's even huge. the ones that appear similar mm -hmm. have very distinct mechanics of how you engage with them and, and fight them. I think that design-wise, one of the very interesting things about the Colossi is how uncomfortable it is to think about how they happened. Because it's yeah. like, like parts of them are clearly architectural. It looks like they were built, but they can't have been built because they're also clearly animals. You know, they have yeah. fur, they bleed, that kind of thing. But like, did did they grow? Were they built? You can't see anywhere where there's easy like seams to identify. Where it's like maybe this part was built around the thing that was grown. They are designed in such a clever way that you cannot come to any conclusions about how they happened because they don't make sense. Yeah. They are constructed, but it's like it's not like oh this thing's like a cyborg. Parts of it look robotic. Parts of it look organic. It's more like the way these are blended. It it kind of hurts your brain to think about. Yeah. And when we get the explanation of what they are, it doesn't tell us sh no. It's like Dorman's <laughs> body was severed into 16 pieces, and that's these things. And it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Clearly some kind of magical transmutation occurred to turn, like, like a chunk of arm into one of these guys. But, like, what the sh And that's what I like. I like it when a game gives you a thing that isn't fully explained, not because they don't have an explanation, or not because it doesn't make sense, but because sometimes it's good to leave things vague. Yeah. It, the Colossi are the noodle incidents of game design. Hey. We, we as Wander, don't belong here and don't deserve an answer to how yeah. these things came about. And Wander doesn't care. He just needs to kill it to get his dead maybe girlfriend back. Yep. Malice but, is bro probably the weirdest one from that perspective. Yeah. Because it's just fully like, it's the Tower of Babel, but there's a body in it. Yeah. Like, what the f***? <laughs> it's head so clearly sculpted. Yeah. A mask. I maybe thought it was like, it's like a lighthouse in a sentry turret, but even then it's like, I don't know. Yeah, that's too why much is, purpose for Yeah. yeah. I why think is it so big? <laughs> there's a reason why this place is forbidden. Yeah. And why you're not supposed to go there. And part of it might have to do with the fact that only the sword can kill these guys. Yeah. And they're not supposed to be killed because that's bad. That's how Dorman comes back. Oh no. Yeah. And each of them is a completely unique puzzle. They're all absolutely beautiful in how they move. Like when Phalanx rises out of the ground in the desert, Desert. It is probably one of the, the most gorgeous little bits of game animation, how its little wings just kind of flicker out one by one. Mm -hmm. What I like about the way you engage with them is that you always begin by trespassing in their space and antagonizing them. Yeah. Whether you trespass and then shoot them to antagonize them, or whether you trespass and that is enough of them being pissed off to just want to kill you. Oh, yeah. uh, like with Leo, who's um, Solosia. Uh, is the, the the first one with with the fire? Oh yeah! But it's the way that it's it it's presented is you are the underdog, you're the small one, you are afraid of them, therefore your fear is justified and you have to kill it. It's a very clever little trick mm -hmm. of of framing to make you feel like you're in the right, even though you absolutely the hell are not. <laughs> the very first Colossus fight, it's the, that Colossus is just kind of patrolling a little valley. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a big open space. There's like cliff faces, but not like convenient like caves, yeah. there's nothing to climb. So you're just kind of forced to be on ground level while this thing patrols around. And I I remember, cause I was playing at that point, I like made a break for the cliffside and I was just like mashed against it, sort of slowly watching the Colossus lumber back into view. And at some point I realized like, its body language has changed. It's like leaning over. It's looking for me. Yeah. And immediately like panic set in. <laughs> Cause yeah. it's like, what are the rules? How do I beat this thing? Dorman's not giving me any helpful tool tips. What do I do? <laughs> and it's like, I gotta figure this out quick cause it's on the attack now, or at yeah. least it's looking for me. And that was frightening enough. It's amazing. The yeah. design is impeccable. It is such a cool way to do a boss fight as opposed to the kinds of boss fights we're used to in games where we're just kind of trading attacks back and forth. Mm -hmm. And it's just, hit it a bunch before it smushes you yeah. and you die. It's a great kind of gameplay. There are a lot of games that do that really well. We'll talk about one of them later uh, in, in Elden Ring, which is just like mm -hmm. boss fights galore. And they're all great. Everyone loves the boss fights in Elden Ring for good reason. They're really good. But these are so specifically designed as puzzles that is almost completely unique to this game and yeah. basically none others. <laughs> so... One of the things we kind of danced around is the idea of restraint 
in how this game is designed, and that is by far the most impressive trait of Shadow of the Colossus, is not just the music, not just the tone, not just the gameplay, not just the world or the colossi, but the restraint employed in all of those to make the moments where things hit all that more impactful. The weather is completely the same across the Forbidden Lands, the entire mm -hmm. game, until you get to Malice and it starts raining. Yeah. And that restraint throughout the game makes that hit so much harder when you get there. It's so beautifully simple in how it's constructed. No backstory, no bullshit. <laughs> No excess dialogue, no side quest, nothing to distract from the core emotions and core experience. Mm -hmm. It's a philosophy that Fumito Ueda at Team Ico called design by subtraction. There's a very good Game Maker's Toolkit video about this, talking about uh, Ico specifically. Right. Removing anything that does not serve the core intended experience. And there is truly so much that they could have put in that they held back to make the game work that the way to make the game work the way it does. So they're limiting the backstory, the dialogue, the side activities, and the mechanics. There's only so much you can do in the world. You can run around, you can shoot lizards, you can jump on stuff, and that's kind of it. That's kinda but it. it maximizes the emotions you get out of a very specific band of interactions with the world and the things that the world presents to you. Mm -hmm. It's 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 perfectly min-maxed game design. Yeah, and it kind of makes other comparable games feel cluttered in response because yeah. essentially it's kind of a little like if you give a mouse a cookie scenario like for instance if you added a concept of horse stamina yeah. if you could only spur on aggro a limited number of times uh, and then you would need to wait that adds time to your traversal of the overworld yeah. and if you're spending more time traversing the overworld well the players might get annoyed if there's nothing for them to do along the way yeah so maybe we could pepper in some more collectibles some side quests some some overworld threats some little guys running around maybe we could do that uh or, or like arrow counts that's one of the ones we yep. noticed it's like oh this is very generous we can just shoot infinite arrows if we want and it's like in a lot of games it's like that's too broken we gotta limit that otherwise the player can just park themselves somewhere and pepper are little guys full of arrows from a distance. So no, we have to make arrows a limited resource. And then we need to make it so that they can get more arrows. Maybe we add a crafting mechanic, or maybe we add drops where they can get arrows from like smashable pots or from uh, from enemies that drop them or something like that. Uh, and the thing is at that point, you're adding layers and layers and layers of stuff to yeah. the game. And they were like, we're not doing any of that. You have infinite arrows because anything else would be complicated. Yep. You have infinite horse stamina because anything else would be annoying. There's only two overtly gamey elements that show up on the screen, and that is your health, <laughs> and, and also the Colossus's health. Um, but even still, mm -hmm. it doesn't need a health bar mm -mm. because the the sigils just go dark after you stab it. So the Colossus health bar is kind of optional. It is still nice to have. <laughs> it's nice to have. But the the second thing is just your stamina, which is kind of the one mechanic by which you interact with the world and kind of need to have that information. Mm -hmm. There are ways they probably could have conveyed it without needing a UI element, and I think mm -hmm. you can turn it off in the menus. Yeah. I, I am happy to have the UI element, but it's impressive that it's just down in the corner. It only shows up when you're using it. It's it's a great example of how much restraint is in this game, that every gamey element that would distract from the vision is just cut out. It's pure, it's laser focused, it's so effective, and that makes it easier to remember, to have nostalgia for, to reminisce on, because you're only remembering that core experience. You're not remembering any of the other stuff that's in the way. If there yeah. was like a, hey, Wander, go collect 12 flowers to, to do this thing before you go fight Pelagia. It's mm -hmm. like, no, you just you just go and kill that yeah. That's it. <laughs> that's, uh, again, one of the things I liked and also complained about with Tears of the Kingdom. So much game in this game. They put things in the way of you doing the thing you want yeah. to do. And usually that ends up being fun, because most people play games because they enjoy the process of playing it. So when a game is like, here's more things to do, it's like, Great. yay! This game is like, you are here for one reason. Yeah. Here it is. No bull. And for, for Tears of the Kingdom Breath of the Wild, you are living off of the world. You're yep. doing all this stuff to to gain resources from the world, to put that back... Hi, Cleo. Hi, Cleo. <laughs> to, to put that back into to your kit. You are engaging with all these different elements to feel like you are a part of this world. You're not supposed to feel like you're a part of the Forbidden Land. It no. is so distinctly empty for that experience. <laughs> this game is a shining golden masterpiece of design. Oh boy. <laughs> but it does have a few issues that can sometimes get in the way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. First and foremost, and you've probably been screaming this in the monitor the whole time if you've played this game. Uh-oh, gamers, these controls are dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Everyone needs to know that when this game first came out, 
all of the reviews were saying exactly this. They were like, yeah. this is beautiful. Games as art. The music is incredible. The monster design is great. Controls kind of suck. But other than that... <laughs> yeah. And for the for the new uh, remake, they, they modified some of the controls to make a little more sense where it's like, okay, X is jump. Great. Mm -hmm. Love that. But still... The movement along these these Colossus surfaces, uh, controlling aggro, famously difficult. It took us like 10 minutes to figure out the make aggro go forward button. Yeah, we it's, had to look online. It was yeah. embarrassing. Yeah. It's, uh, it's also uh, a case of pretty wonky animations because they're doing inverse kinematics in order to make you move on a giant physics object. A lot of these animations are not kind of pre-coded. It's just like, okay, Wander's leg has to go here. So if you look at his animation cycle, his leg kind of snaps out a little bit in yeah. his run because it's inverse kinematics. It, it's got a little bit of a rough quality to some of the animations. And when you're crawling around in a Colossus, it can be wonky trying to get a sense of where you're going and how you're just getting like, you know, thrown yeah. around everywhere. It is weird in places. It is not clean controls. Wander's primary mechanic is, of course, climbing on jump because the only way you can kill the Colossi is to climb up them in most cases. So it's a lot of jumping and grabbing and climbing. And the game tries to cheat you towards grabbable surfaces. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're quite generous about it. But this can be bad in the in the case of the fight that you have on the slide. Yeah. The final phase of the fight is you need to let the Colossus slam his hand down near you, and then you need to run and grab the fur on his palm, yep. and then you need to stab him. Uh, and that sounds pretty simple. There's several stages, like, it took me, what, six tries before oh, it finally started working? so many more than that, yeah. And I think it was, like, six tries before I had a successful stab. Oh, and the then, first time, and then it yeah. was, like, six more, yeah. Yeah, so basically, you can see he's got this little wrist guard. It's a grabbable surface. Like, three separate times that I ran there, w Wander helpfully latched onto there, and there's no way to get from there to his palm unless you get a very lucky fling in yeah. that general direction. And I didn't. And Wander cannot, like, when you're getting ragdolled around, Wander can't climb. Yeah. He just holds on for dear life. Yeah. So you can't move around when you're getting wiggled around. And some of these colossi just... The, just the, wiggle. The break in their wiggle cycle is really unforgivingly small. And I didn't have, like, the precision jump required to get from there to there. Also, when he slams his hand down, if you're too close, it flings you wide and ragdolls you. Yeah. And Wander takes, like, ten seconds to get up. Yeah. Also, uh, when you were trying to get on uh, Colossus 15's uh, hand... Uh, the grab button is the crouch button, so Wander uh, helpfully crouched in yeah. front of the Colossus's hand for about 70% uh, of Red's attempts. Yeah, you need to <laughs> run up to it, hit the jump button, because when you're jumping, grab works. But otherwise, it's crouch. So I'd, I'd be like, I'm, I'm there. I'm finally there. Why is Wander on the ground? Yeah. It was very annoying. Yeah. And like the, the specific thing about like how unforgiving the Colossus like attack cycles are, they clearly very carefully made it so that they will not usually hit you while you are still ragdolled, except in the case of Malice, the final Colossus, where he will just keep bombarding you with lasers until you are out of his sight, which I think is cool. I yeah. think that's actually clever. That's good design because it, it, it sets you back to a neutral point where he will eventually blow you off the side of the map into an area where you can recover. Right. A, a little trough. And anywhere they do that. We'll get there later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've got more grievances. We'll get to that one later. But the, the the main problem that I kept running into is, like, the Colossi are puzzle boxes, but figuring out the solution and executing the solution are two different things. Yeah. So you can reach the point where you know exactly what you need to do to beat the Colossus, and then it is just a matter of waiting for R and Jesus to cooperate yep. and let you actually do it. Because that at that point, it's boss AI, it's Wander's janky grab animations. Yeah. It's, it's not even a skill problem at that point. It's just like, why isn't this working? And that produces frustration and breaks immersion. And that's on top of if you think you're on a solution mm -hmm. and you can't tell, am I doing this wrong or yeah. is the solution something else? For an example of both yep, of those, yep. <laughs> this is Pelagia. Fuck, Fuck Pelagia. Pelagia. Yes. <laughs> if you watched our animation, you know what's up. This yeah. sucks, and I'm glad he's dead. It was bad the second time round. Though, and this, I remember this frustrated me the first time we played because I was like, "Is there a trick to getting up onto Pelagia?" Because it feels like there should be. Because he's got, he, like, I can see that he's got fur on his back. It looks like I'm supposed to climb it, but I can't reach him because he swims just fast enough that I can't reach him. And in terms of mechanics, the game doesn't have that I'm glad about. Swimming doesn't take stamina. Thank God. A lot of these puzzles would basically be impossible if swimming took stamina. So that's good. But with Pelagia, you kind of need to get like a running jump. And even then you need to swim for your fucking life after his ass. Yeah. 
and sometimes it doesn't work. And, like, if he figures out you're there, he will start trying to turn around. He turns around faster than you can go, so, yeah. And in that case, it's like, am I doing this wrong? This feels like it must be a dead end because it's not working. And then on, like, the fifth try, it's like, oh, no, this was absolutely what I was supposed to do. The game was just making it needlessly difficult. And it's like, there's no malice in it. The game's not purposefully jerking you around. They were just like, yeah, we've given the Colossi this kind of AI. They have this kind of design. They do this sort of thing. Here's the way to beat him. Good fucking luck. No yeah. hand holding. Yeah. You get dormant tool tipping in your ear sometimes. <laughs> like, a moving bridge to cross to higher ground. Get higher up, idiot. <laughs> Try getting good. It's Lucky like, numbers, 17, 24, eh? Yeah, fucking fortune cookie ass. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Celosia. God, I'm so glad we get to complain about this one. Yeah. <laughs> Pyrophobic jackass. So Celosia is one of, I think he's the first small colossus. He's the first small colossus you fight. And it's a fun little moment, because you're like, oh no, they can be small and fast and really aggressive. Yep. That's frightening. This main thing is that he's afraid of fire. There are these big braziers around. His first attack in the game, he'll knock a torch out of a, a fire thing thing it's a little scripted event and then you can pick it up uh which is not intuitive because you've never picked up, you've a never picked up weapon an before. item before yeah but you can you kind of you you're like when in doubt crouch on top of it and it works the torch can also go out as we learned uh, yes <laughs> so, uh, so you basically drive Celosia back and then uh because Celosia you can see is heavily armored no visible weak points so you're like i gotta break the armor so you you drive him back with the torch and he falls and breaks his armor and he's a little bit stunned and then you can drop down onto his back and he immediately wakes up and starts charging and it will take your entire stamina wheel to kill him you and the can one cycle it yes barely which is what i did the second time through because the first time through i was like my stamina is getting pretty low i'll uh it looks like he's running me through this area. There are little climbable ledges. So I think I'll just get to higher ground, get a little breather, and then jump on him again. As soon as I got off of Celosia, <laughs> he, uh, he rammed into me and, like, ragdolled me across the ground. And, of course, Wander takes 10 seconds to get up. And as soon as I got up, he hit me again. Yep. So what happened is Celosia basically bunced me into a corner of the level geometry and kept me there. <laughs> and the thing is that the bunces don't do a ton of health. Because clearly the game is like, you're going to get f***ing headbutted by this thing. So we don't want to just kill you. So it was two minutes of just sitting there waiting to die. Well, I was trying to find a way to, like, maybe if I roll to safety. And it's like, great, I've rolled no five way. feet away. Celosia is still within headbutting range. Yeah. And he just knocked me back into the corner. So eventually I was like, f*** it, fine, I'll reload the save. And it put me back in the temple. Yeah. And I had to do the entire fight again. That was rough. So I was not afraid of Celosia. I was pissed yeah. at the game. And that's not where you want to be with a game this beautiful and immersive. Yeah. This guy, sorry, we're <laughs> like, good. Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. First, now that I've enumerated my grievances. <laughs> yeah, it's great when the puzzle boxes work. When they don't, when you have to do something unintuitive, like grab an item type you've never had to grab before because there haven't been item types in the game to pick up. Because the game up. is so simple. Yeah, yeah, it just breaks and it stops working pretty much at all. And it will be different from player to player. But if you just get stuck in such a way that you're you're on a cycle where the Colossus keeps shaking you, you can't get a handhold, and mm -hmm. you have to do this whole sequence over again, it just gets frustrating. Where it's like, I know what I have to do. I've solved the puzzle. Now let me just solve the puzzle. Yeah. That, uh, that execute awkward, the solution. That awkward gap between I know how to do it and I, I'm not doing anything wrong. The game is just not cooperating. Like, nobody wants to be that gamer who's like, this controller's bullshit. My dad works at Nintendo. But yeah. like... And, and the thing is, the reason why this happens is for the same reason the game is good. The game does not handhold. If as soon as you figured out how to kill the Colossus, you effortlessly one-shotted them, they would stop feeling intimidating. Yeah. They would just feel like, an example, I know we're going to bring this up later, the Divine Beast in Zelda. Yeah. They are these big, nightmarish creatures. You have to do a lot of work to get inside them. And then it is basically push four buttons. Yeah. And occasionally you fight other, like, other little guys along the way. But it's push four buttons. And, and even the, getting to the Divine Beast itself is dead easy. <laughs> usually quite simple, especially after you've already done it once or twice. Yeah. Whereas these guys, like, you could have fought them before. And unless you're, like, a speedrunner, you're going to have a bad time anyway. Yeah. Uh, and, like, that's good. It makes the Colossi feel frightening and annoying. And annoying is good sometimes. But not in the moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 two types of, of frustration that it can get is... I can't figure out the solution, what the hell does it want me to do, or I can figure out the solution, the game's just being jank, the controls are bad, and I can't execute it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is a distinct downside that, again, when the game came out, people acknowledged it. This is not like, we're not the first ones to figure this out. This is a, a known setback of this kind of design. But you know what I'll say I respect? 
the remake doesn't even try to fix it. No. It's just like, fuck you, have fun. <laughs> the only thing it does do is it gives you special items you can get on subsequent playthroughs if you do the speedrun mode, where it's <laughs> like, yeah, here's a javelin you can throw which does as much damage as a sword, have fun, kids. It's yep. like, nice, I like right. that. Um, but then also, uh, it's an open world without any conveniences. It is a wonderful, immersive landscape, uh, and it's great and fun and cool until you get stuck in a weird area and don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. You go in the wrong direction and have to turn around. You have to cross the whole map without aids like fast travel. If you want to get to a boss quickly, it's like, look, I already did this. Let me just go back. Or if you pause for a second and realize there is truly almost nothing you can actually do here. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's okay most of the time, but when you brush up against the bounds of the system with the like with the controls like with the, the puzzle design it's great when you're in that lane just doing the thing but if you if you stop for a second or if you get stuck or if you brush up against the edge of of what you're supposed to be doing it can get really tricky to kind of set yourself back on the right course and do the thing you're supposed to do go to the place you're yep. supposed to go without you know resorting to a walkthrough or figuring out like i'm in this forest how the hell do i get to pelagia yeah. oh you have to go left you in have this... to make a sharp right yeah followed by a sharp exactly left, and then you need to not jump in the water until later because you will get flung down the water yeah jump in the water but not that water yeah it's it's a pain the game is not really optimized for you to fuck up because like <laughs> the wonder takes such a long time to fall down into the kill plane <laughs> it's so small I, it's so, it's so slow well i honestly think it's because they probably do a little bit of generousness to make wander feel floaty yeah. and fall slowly because you spend so much time high up it's good for you to be able to kind of like re-angle if you're falling but what this means is that if you go over the side of a cliff the game's not like okay there's no possible way you can recover you have to watch him very slowly fall and like feel the controller bounce as he just smacks into every rock along the way before it finally is like okay he's dead enough and since you have generous air control you can make him do a little pirouettes as he's falling <laughs> to his doom that oh he does those funny. anyway i've discovered yeah so there, there are there are a lot of faults to Shadow the Colossus that have been well documented since the beginning. We're not we're not the mm -hmm. first ones to discover these. But the thing is, the the great thing and the terrible thing, and then the great thing again is that Shadow the Colossus's faults are bound to its successes, and there cannot be one without the other in both directions. Physics based movement is fundamentally unreliable. When you get to the edge cases, things get weird, mm -hmm. but it is absolutely categorically necessary for gameplay where you climb on physics objects. The jank is inherent. There are a lot of games that have gone through a lot of really wonky solutions to try to get you to move on a surface and make that not explode. Yeah. Shadow of the Colossus figured that out in 2005. There's jank, but that's the price for being able to climb on moving monsters where they are moving around, but also traveling through the world. That's an understandable trade-off to make in that circumstance to be able to have the fundamental gameplay of climbing on stuff. Mm -hmm. You're gonna get that inverse kinematics jank. Secondly, when the puzzle box design works, it is extremely satisfying to unravel the boss. And if you don't run into those edge cases, you're pretty much solid all the way through. The other thing is that the Colossi are so distinct that each player will enjoy and struggle with different bosses. There are some players who will get through Celosia first try mm -hmm. because they just one cycle it and it's good. And they'll think, oh yeah, no, I can I can get this thing. I, I saw what he knocked into. I'll light this on fire. I'll, I'll use that as a weapon. People can figure one thing out and be completely stumped on another one. We hate that b Pelagia because we <laughs> jumped on its hooves that one time in the stream and got dunked into the ass end of hell. Yeah, didn't want and to another player really. might just completely miss that. And they will have a really frustrating time with a boss we thought was easy. Like, I know some people are needless contrarians who think that Phalanx is a bad boss. <laughs> It's just different for every player. Yeah, so some sin people are wrong, and that's okay. Yeah, God, no, dude. perfectly. But since the bosses are so uniquely designed, there's going to be individual blind spots for individual players and individual frustrations for individual players where everyone's going to have their favorite, everyone's going to have the one they hate. We are not alone in thinking Pelagia and Cenobia suck, but... <laughs> is it Cenobia or Celosia? Whatever. Oh, sorry, uh, Cenobia is later. Celosia uh, sucks. Cenobia is the one in the in the garden with, with the towers and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, that was Yeah, the, the, their names are... The pillar one that we actually like. The pillar one that we like. We're, we're not alone, but we also recognize that's not a majority opinion because different players just have different bosses that they bounce off against, and that's the price of variety. That's The benefit is that they're also different. The drawback is that you have to ask a lot of different kinds of lateral thinking for the player to figure stuff out. Mm -hmm. When it works, it works. When it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But that's the price for having these bosses being so unique and distinct and specifically designed with a puzzle. Puzzles can be frustrating. That's the game.
Yep, it is a it is an unfortunate truth of this game that all the things that make it so uniquely good and so immersive are also the things that immediately break your immersion. There's no there's not an ounce of fat on the game, which means there's no insulation essentially. Yeah, there's no insulation. So like, exactly. oh, the map is beautiful. The the uh, the riding across the field is beautiful until you realize you've gone half the map in the wrong direction. Like, it's beautiful until you have to go through it twice yeah. <laughs> or more. So the the emptiness of the open world directly supports the intended emotional effect of, of traveling through it, being on that adventure each time. Mm -hmm. And as an thought experiment, I'm like, would Shadow of the Colossus be better if it had a bunch of shrines in it? I don't think so. I don't think so either. It would have various conveniences, but it would detract from the intended emotional experience of, of being alone on this journey every time you have to go out all the way to the Colossus, track it down, find where it is, and go ruin its day. And if there were other breaks in the way of that, it would disrupt that flow that you get into as the player. Yep. It's almost perfectly calculated so that the time you spent getting to the Colossus is the same time as the fight. So there's this great rhythm that you get from there's the travel section, there's the boss. There's the travel section, there's the boss. It's a perfect flow for each one. And if the open world was more dense, it would disrupt the flow. You'd spend a lot more time in the world and a lot less time with the bosses. If the world was bigger, it would be more time in the world and less time with the bosses. So mm -hmm. it, it's it's calculated in exactly such a way to have that effect. And unfortunately, that means sacrificing those conveniences. So this is a series of compromises that Shadow of the Colossus chose to make. And on recollection, when you hear the music, when you see the screenshots, when you, when you think about the game, your mind will jump to that pathos. Yeah. the tone the emotions that you get when playing it of, of of triumph and sadness and and loneliness and fear and and victory but that requires those nasty compromises and yeah. when other developers try to emulate shadow of the colossus those are rough edges they are going to want to sand off one thing i wanted to mention is that uh when you think about like oh this boss you might remember like i had a hard time with it but in most cases even the frustration of like yeah the control scheme was kind of bullshit and I had to like reload the save because it kept just headbutting me into a corner and there was no possible way for me to escape you know that kind of thing it's like it kind of all just blends together into yeah that was a hard boss fight and I felt good when I eventually killed it and that's the thing is when there's a boss fight that's a bastard you you slay it and you're yeah. like good like get back up see what happens it might break your immersion a little bit in the game that you're like this video game is being mean to me but yeah. like afterwards you're like I had a good time with this video game even the parts where it tried to kill me a few times. Yeah, I, it's like, I can't wait to go back to Pelagia and show that headless b who's boss. Yeah. <laughs> Get back up so I can kill you again. Exactly. And again, when you go back on subsequent playthroughs with extra weapons, you can take even more joy in more efficiently downing these these awful monsters that you hate specifically. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. the bosses you like, you get to enjoy the fight, and the bosses you hate, you just get to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the kind of thing that, that on reflection, over time, afterwards, it evens out in your mind and you're left with the best parts of it. You'll remember the things that you didn't like, but it's not going to be top of mind. For some people it will be, but for, for most players, they remember the experience that the developers intended, not the jank. You think about the jank later, but it's not the first thing your brain goes to. When you hear the music, when you're in a concert, for instance, <laughs> yeah. hearing live music, you are on that horse going through the night to the gates of the Forbidden Land. You're not thinking about how much of a bitch Pelagia is. Yeah, yeah, you're not like, remember that one time I got dug to the bottom of the lake? That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Exactly. So there are a lot of things that various developers have tried to emulate from Shadow of the Colossus over the years, but striking that balance effectively to maximize the things that are good, minimize the things that are bad, is difficult. So we're going to take a look at how a couple notable instances uh, of, of later games have essentially tried to wrangle with this legacy of this game, yeah. and, and how they manage it, and how they don't manage it, and how some smart developers have tried to kind of skirt the question altogether, and arrive at something that makes sense and, and works for, for its specific design considerations. So, mm -hmm. so let's take a look at a few examples. First off, of course, very important for the channel here, uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. On paper, 
It is a pretty straightforward uh, parallel to the things you're doing in Shadow of the Colossus. You're traversing a wide, deserted landscape, and in Breath of the Wild, you're fighting ginormous divine beasts. Uh, in Tears of the Kingdom, you can come across giant beasts uh, in the depths, which is probably the most yeah. accurate capturing of that feeling of you have entered into this monster's abode, and it is fine, but when it notices you, it's not going to be. There's there's a lot of stuff that, that on paper is, is pretty similar one to the other, but but there is a lot more, Red, as you've said, there's a lot more game in these games. There's yeah. a lot more that you're doing than just traveling through the world. You're gathering resources, you're talking to NPCs, you're doing quests, you're opening up shrines, you're doing all this stuff, and you are really deeply immersed in the world by how much you are putting into it, getting out of it, learning about it, mm -hmm. going to different areas to, to figure out different things and get different resources and dealing with different temperature problems and weather events and stuff, and it's a very dynamic kind of experience, but it is at the opposite end of the radical simplicity of Shadow of the Colossus. Yeah, effectively, so the, the plot of Shadow of the Colossus is a straight line, and while the map is big, the gameplay experience is also essentially a straight line, which is part of why it becomes so frustrating if you're like, I went down the wrong way and now I need to mm -hmm. backtrack, because there is no benefit to exploration, really. Yeah. The most you might find is like, oh, this is an arena where I will fight a Colossus later. And the thing is, people who play the game multiple times or like data mine the maps to like find other cool stuff and yeah. development stuff, they have a great fucking time, and that's awesome. But like, there is no gameplay benefit to exploring around, except you might raise your stamina a little bit in a way that rarely makes or breaks the difference in a boss fight, since they're all programmed to work no matter how many lizards you've caught, because yeah. otherwise the game would not be progressible, essentially. Do you imagine if it was like the Triforce quest in, in Wind Waker, where it's like, you have to get these ten lizards before you can fight Phalanx? Yeah, that would be, that would be bad. <laughs> Riots. It's, it's good that they didn't do that. So the plot and the gameplay experience of Shadow of the Colossus are straight lines. The plot of... Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom is a straight line, but the gameplay experience is not. Yeah. Uh, and the developers purposefully built it like that. Uh, they, there's a there's a video uh, about how basically the developers were like, yeah, when we first had the map and we let like alpha testers at it, uh, they would either like follow the roads or they would just pick a random direction and go and there would be like nothing interesting diverting them from their straight line path. And what they ended up doing was like populating the entire map with micro dungeons in the form of shrines, which, you know, dramatically rewarded free exploration yeah. and like in every case you can do things out of order in fact the game is like designed so that oh you stumble on a geoglyph and it's like a middle memory it yeah. drops you in the middle of what you're doing in tears of the kingdom and like the order of operations of the memories in breath of the wild you would need to go to hyrule castle first to get the earlier memories earlier yeah so it's intentionally kind of out of order so you know you, you've got in shadow of the colossus linear game linear plot in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, linear story, well, linear plot, non-linear game. Yeah. And while Shadow of the Colossus was kind of groundbreaking and, like, it, it's a huge map, there's no loading zones, you just go places. Yeah, no loading zones in 2005? Yeah. Unappreciated benefit. <laughs> uh -huh. It produces this very, like, it feels like an open world with a lot that you don't know is happening. Whereas Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, when you 100% complete any of those games, you start to hit the wall of tedium. You start yeah. having to find every Korok. You start having yeah. to spelunk for every shrine. It It's not as rewarding to 100% Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom because after a certain point, you're polishing dirt. Whereas Shadow of the Colossus, you 100% it on your first playthrough. There is no way to less than 100% it, essentially. <laughs> I mean, I'm not counting the fucking lizards. Yeah, um, I'm not counting the lizards and, and the coins you can find. But again, there aren't that many. 72 mm -hmm. coins versus 900 Koroks or, you know, 100-something shrines. The point of Breath of the Wild is that there is so much stuff to do. It is a very full world. Mm -hmm. Even though Hyrule is broken, it is still full and lush in Breath of the Wild. And that's yeah. the point, and it works well for exactly what it's trying to do. Mm -hmm. It has the surface aesthetics of a Shadow of the Colossus type game, but it very purposefully avoided the specific elements of Shadow of the Colossus that are that are most distinct tonally and and gameplay wise in terms of how you're like interacting with the world. There's so much more you can do in Zelda. Yeah. And if you couldn't, it would be a nightmare. So this is a great example of a game that makes several diversions from the format of Shadow of the Colossus to good effect. Yeah. There's also a couple other points. One of them is on the slideshow. Uh, it is also, as we mentioned, not a tragedy. Shadow of the Colossus yep. is a tragedy. It is a character whose traits 
could make him heroic in another story, but because of the format of the story and the deal he makes with Dorman, he essentially becomes the final boss, yeah. very briefly. Whereas Link, similarly, uh, like a, a bit of a blank slate protagonist, we don't know a whole lot about him aside from what we see in the memories. He's a selflessly determined heroic type with a magic sword that he picked up, and it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, this is the same character in a different font, but because Link is in a world where he is the hero, the game is allowed to have a happy ending. Yeah. Whereas Wander is functionally very similar. Like, oh yes, a mysterious force told me I need to do this thing and subdue these massive beasts to get what I want. And in this case, it's like, to save Zelda. Yeah. Like, Link doesn't have the motive. I mean, Link does save Hyrule, but he's not like, I must do this thing. He doesn't say... Uh, but like, <laughs> like it's the well, same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the same level of like, oh, I need to save this girl by killing these big things, or at least fixing them, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the divine beasts are interestingly quite different feeling from the colossi, because I think like their first impression is great. All of yes. them have this really intimidating intro, but they don't really do a whole lot. The first time I played through the game, I did it very much the way you're supposed to. The second time through, I did a little more free exploration, and when I did that, I had one cool moment where I ran into Vana Boris just out in the desert, yeah. could not outrun it in time, and got struck by lightning. That was cool, but I kind of had to do the go go in a straight line and don't really yeah. get distracted thing to make that happen. And the game doesn't really make it easy on you, because, like, no. your maps are fucked up. Anyway, so the thing is, the Divine Beasts fix one of the problems that we were complaining about with the Colossi to the detriment of their intimidation factor. Exactly. Because the way you defeat them is topologically the same. The Colossi have a certain number of weak points, insert sword A into point B and you're fine. The Divine Beasts have four or five terminals, you slap your iPad on them and you call it a day. Which is tonally absolutely flaccid in it's, comparison. It's totally quite different, but <laughs> gameplay-wise, it is the same thing. Find the right spot, you maybe have to do some shenanigans to get there, or move things around so you can get there, change the map a little bit so you can get there, but you get there, and then you, boop, and then you're fine. And then it spits out a boss fight for you, which is nothing like the Colossus fights, that's no. very much. It, it's also a little bit different from classic Zelda bad guys, although I do like them. I like mm -hmm. the Blights. The Blights are good, yeah. Uh, but the thing is, the Divine Beasts themselves lose all sense of intimidation factor pretty much as soon as you get inside them. It can't hurt you when you're inside it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it can't hurt you, but also it doesn't seem to want to do anything. Because the Divine Beasts are, like, causing large-scale problems. Like, oh, Naboris has a lightning aura. Va Meadow is shooting things out of the sky. Trust me, bro. The, there would be tons of Rito flying around that would be hard to render. I promise. <laughs> but uh, for some strange reason, we can't do that. I like Tears of the Kingdom allowing us to have more Rito flying around yeah. a little bit more. But um, the Divine Beasts are extremely intimidating, and I love their soundtracks again the music is music great is the good. vibes are good. great but because there is no element of chaos there is no element of unpredictability and there is no feeling that they are sentient things that want you dead yeah. then nothing really you don't get the intimidation factor they become kind of punchlines and they're uh, dead easy to actually encounter yes even the the most shadow of the colossus -y part of the divine beast encounters being when you actually get up to them and have to like make it to the divine beast to get inside of the thing yep. it's cool at first and then you think about it as like i'm not I'm not actually doing anything that is even remotely challenging. I'm not afraid yeah. of these. It's cool that it's big, yep. but there's no element of narrative, tonal, or mechanical fear that is strong enough to really make them linger, which is mm -hmm. why I feel like a lot of people liked the idea of the Divine Beasts a lot, but couldn't help but walk away feeling a little bit let down by them. Mm -hmm. Because in the world of Breath of the Wild, story, gameplay, tone, are all in sync. For the Divine Beasts, that's just not the case as strongly, which I, I think is why one aspect of the game works so well, yep. and another aspect of the game is like, eh, I see what they were going for, but nah. And it's a really good example of the thesis of this slideshow. In solving a problem from Shadow of the Colossus, they accidentally at the same time yep. undercut one of the best parts of Shadow of the Colossus, how terrifying the Colossi are. For instance, like there, there's a little one-to-one -one parallel. Va Meadow, is that the, that's the bird one? That's the bird. Yeah. Va Meadow and Colossus number five, five. Avion. A yeah, the bird. The, the bird, the fucking bird. <laughs> Anyone that we had to fight over a lake was not Blue's favorite. Um, <laughs> but like that one, it's got a similar vibe. They've got a very similar silhouette. If you go back a few slides, you can actually see like, oh yeah, that, that could be Va Meadow. Va Meadow just flies in a big circle and doesn't do anything except shoot you out of the sky if you get near it. That bird, the way that you progress in that fight, it just sits 
on a big pillar and you need to shoot arrows at it and when it gets mad at you it fucking dive bombs at you and you need to jump and cling on for dear life as it tries to shake you off it's really harrowing and it's easy to fuck up and if you fall off you usually need to spend a while swimming across the lake to get back to where you were and then and could you imagine if it kingfishered you oh no. <laughs> that would be the worst that, thing in the world that would be pretty awful <laughs> but like that's the thing it's terrifying. Vomito is not. Vomito is not. And that's that's just how it worked out. Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom were not setting out to terrify the audience, I think. Yeah. Except maybe the depths a little bit. Maybe but like, the depths. And yeah. the gloom hands. Let's not forget the gloom the hands. The gloom hands, yeah. <laughs> but it's a very different feel than Shadows of the Colossus. And that was clearly intentional. A lot of intentionality went into the design of bosses uh, in, in both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, which is why I think Tears of the Kingdom went a little bit closer to classic Zelda boss designs mm -hmm. with a lot of the final dungeons. Yeah. And that was very cool. I like that a lot. But the end result is, like, if they were aiming to do another Shadow of the Colossus, which clearly they only sort of were. They were aiming to get some of the vibes, yeah. but not be more Shadow of the Colossus. Mm -hmm. The end result is that they, they did not manage to replicate that feeling of dreadful, it's just you and this big thing, and the big thing wants you dead. And it's not faster than you, but... It, it can catch up, but you gotta be yeah. careful. Like, we don't have any of that with the Divine Beasts. They they come close in the depths in Tears of the Kingdom because mm -hmm. when you do stumble onto a boss monster, it is harrowing to see this giant shadowed thing, especially more than any of the other ones, if you come across Kolgara in the depths. Oh, I love the depths that of is, That is just terrifying. But because at the same time, Kolgara's dead easy. Kolgara really is it. dead easy. Yeah. It's only in that approach that it's actually scary because it's like i didn't know it could yeah. be down here and the thing is the ending of tears of the kingdom which i will not spoil in this detailed diatribe in case you have avoided the tears of the kingdom detailed diatribe y'all have had time but this is a courtesy <laughs> yes i have seen the ending of the game at this point i've played it twice and i've seen it multiple times and it has not lost its effectiveness on me I've seen, like, in Breath of the Wild, the final boss fight with Ganon, all the speedrunners are like, this is a joke. Yeah. You, you know, you can't lose. The final boss of Tears of the Kingdom feels similarly unlosable, but I love it so much. And some of the vibes are similar to Shadow of the Colossus, but more triumphant. Yeah. You're clinging to the outside of this immensely powerful thing, but you're not trying to kill it this time. And some of that, that feeling comes through. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think even though I've seen it several times... Even though, you know, people meme on Matt Mercer's excellent performance as Ganondorf. <laughs> Even though, you know, there's all these jokes, I still see the ending hit people emotionally. Yeah. And I certainly still feel it that way. And I think that even if we're like, yeah, the Divine Beasts are nowhere near as cool as the Colossi, you know, they, they look so intimidating and then it's just nothing. I think that, that sense of massive, ponderous terror is something that they pull off in the very final act of Tears of the They Kingdom. absolutely and do. And I really like it. Yeah, and that's that's a case where you're not just aping the format of the other game, it's you're, you're figuring out why it worked and applying mm -hmm. those lessons rather than just copy-pasting, oh, Big Monster, we put Big Monster, everyone yeah. likes Big Monster. You can climb on Big Monster? Yeah. Do you wish to stab Big Monster in soft underbelly? The, the reason I think the, the depths don't work as well as they maybe could is because, one, they're just absolutely huge, <laughs> and you are absolutely fully reliant on fast travel in order to really get around there with any degree of speed uh, mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it is so big, you are bouncing around a lot. It's like, okay, I kind of need this, otherwise I'm going to be down here for hours. You are so used to doing a lot of stuff on the surface that when you get down into the depths, when there's not as much to do, it doesn't feel like it's the intended experience. It feels like, oh, there's nothing here. I'm used to being able to do all this stuff up top, mm -hmm. and now I can't. Even though it is much closer to the design of the Forbidden Lands, the mm -hmm. contrast of above me, there's so much more going on. Down here, it, it just ends up feeling weak in comparison, so context really is everything. Yeah. This is not to say, like, oh, Tears of the Kingdom, Breath of the Wild, bad. They're very good at what they do. Yep. And it's a case of finding the intended gameplay, the intended emotion, matching them together to, to have it work as intended. Mm -hmm. When you get them aligned, you get a great outcome. I will say the depths do match the feeling of the Forbidden Lands of... I'm not supposed to be here. Yes. And to a certain extent, so do the Sky Islands, which is something mm -hmm. I talked about a lot more in my yeah. Lonely Sky Detail Diatribe. Check it out. It was in the All Sleeping category last year. Um, <laughs> and, and just, but the thing about, like, they're beautiful. They're overgrown. They even kind of have a similar color palette to Shadow yeah. of the Colossus. A little bit. A little bit. There's nothing there. You know that the Zonai used to be up there. There used to be a civilization. It's gone. There's no sign of what happened to it, but it's gone. And it kind of produces this feeling of, like, 
I'm not exactly an interloper here, because the only things that were here have been gone for an incomprehensibly long amount of time. Yeah. And, like, they specifically put treasure chests here for me with armor in my size. Canonically, that is what happened in the game. It's explained. But, like, it still doesn't feel like I should be here for long. This place is dead. It's, it's Castle in the Sky energy of, like, mm -hmm. yes, Lapita is beautiful and, and shiny and, and, and overgrown and lovely, but there's a reason nobody's here, and it's because they all left. Yeah. And, and we can't stay here long either. Anyway, I like these games. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is a great example of, of, of how developers have learned from Shadow of the Colossus mm -hmm. and and put it to good use. And, and again, not perfectly, but on the whole... No game is Zel perfect. We don't need to caveat with well, it's no, not perfect. No, 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 but yeah. like, on, like we've said, like, oh, there are things that, that Breath of the Wild Tears of the Kingdom do that are trying to emulate uh, Shadow of the Colossus yes. and don't really nail it, and some things that they do that absolutely do. Right. It's, it's a game of learning the right lessons rather than just copying the thing that works. Yes, very, very true. So this is another example that uh, is probably going to make <laughs> some people sad uh. because The Last Guardian, um, the follow-up game by uh, follow-on studio to uh, Team Eco, Fumito uh, yeah. Ueda's next game. Delayed for so long. The hype was immense. Yeah, it was well-received by the enthusiast crowd. Uh, most critics uh, were able to enjoy uh, what they were going for in the game, mm -hmm. but general audiences found it deeply frustrating because you have all of the peril and pain points of the wonky control system, mm -hmm. plus guiding an animal through a bunch of puzzles with all of those wonky, janky little bits of monster AI. Yeah. It's like the whole game is just trying to point aggro in the right direction. Yeah. And when it works, there's a lot that this game does really well. There is an excellent video by Game Maker's Toolkit uh -huh, on the language uh -huh. of video games talking about one standout moment where the game design fits the story in a really great sequence where you feel the bond with with Trico just shoot up on the charts and it's like, oh my god, this is great. Yep. Trico, best bird. <laughs> but a lot of the rest of the game is just get the damn computer bird to do the thing yep. you want it to do. <laughs> Again, it is the strength and the weakness are exactly the same element of the game. The fact that you cannot just control Trico is what causes the puzzles to be frustrating because it's like I'm waiting for Trico's AI to wake up and do the, the thing I needed to do so I can progress and I can't make it do that faster. But at the same time, this means that when Trico acts in unexpected ways that are heartwarming or good or save you from yeah. a scenario you didn't think you could be saved from because the game had previously not worked that way, it's this hugely heartwarming moment. The frustration and the, like, the fuck yeah moments are coming from the exact same part of the game. Yep. And Team Eco really likes committing to a bit that no other game does, which is essentially building a huge amount of the core gameplay around the character that the player is controlling cannot directly control this. You need to negotiate with an AI, you need mm -hmm. to negotiate with the pathing for your escort quest, you are the escort quest and you don't control the thing that can get you from point A to point B, yeah. and sometimes it'll fuck up and drop you into a kill plane and you just kind of have to <laughs> deal with that. It is a thing that most other games have not committed to because the feeling of like, I'm waiting for the game to wake the fuck up and let me do what needs to be done yeah. is generally not great. And that's a frustration that a lot of developers think is not worth the potential benefit benefits of like, oh, I didn't know he knew how to do that. That's so wonderfully heartwarming. Again, the Game Maker's Toolkit video has some really good examples of that. The end result is still your immersion is broken as soon as the game stops cooperating because then you're like, I'm sitting here waiting for a video game to let me do the thing. And the thing is, this is not the only kind of game mechanic that causes that problems. There's a lot of games where it's like, Oh, you want to do this one thing? Here, do this long, like, trade chain, quest chain <laughs> thing. You're not allowed to have the thing when you know the character has it. You have to jump through all these fucking hoops first. And the character, and you know, the, the player will usually be like, I know what I'm doing. Stop stopping me from doing the thing. It's like when you see a tiny rock that you can't jump over and it's like, come on, like character could yeah. do that. Or like it's... an invisible wall. Or like when you yeah. when you win the fight but then lose in the cutscene after yep. the fight. And it's like, come on, man. It's the moments where the game makes it abundantly clear to you that you are in a video game. Uh -huh. And Shadow of the Colossus's worst moments are when it does that. And unfortunately, all that stuff is is tragically front and center here. Showing that it's not just a case of like, ah, yes, like God designer for me to await and everyone else is an idiot. It's like, no, these are challenging design choices to yep. make. And even the creator himself faced a functionally impossible task in following up Shadow of the Colossus and yep. using those same design elements to craft a similar type of experience. Yeah. It's just flat out hard. The thing that we're complaining about is essentially a feature and not a bug. 
it is the way the game is intended yeah. to work, not the way it's intended to feel. For a little, little scattershot listing of, of different games that capture various elements of, of Shadow of the Colossus, God of War 2 and 3, uh, Corey Barlog went on record about the inspirations of Shadow of the Colossus on then new game, God of War 2. <laughs> uh, the Colossus fight in Rhodes is pretty, pretty on the nose. Uh, and it's a great sequence. People absolutely loved that sequence when the game first came out. And God of War 3 also has a bunch of, of very huge spectacle fights mostly with Poseidon in the beginning of the game, but there are, there are other ones as well. That's a game that leans on the spectacle and size to create a sense of being powerful by vanquishing these big things. Mm -hmm. It also helps that Kratos always kind of feels like a wrecking ball of a character in yeah. terms of how much damage he can do. Yeah. Only tragedy of the God of War series that you don't get to fight Chrysler. I want to kill that bird. I want to kill that <laughs> ass bird. Give um, me God of War Ragnarok 2. Fight that <laughs> ass oh, bird. Please. Please, Kari. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, another example is Elden Ring, which is following on Breath of the Wild, basically now the best new uh, open world design in a game. It is so well done. I am a baby, so I have not played Elden Ring, <laughs> but the people who play it love the hell out of it, and I can completely understand why. It's a great example of how the way you interact with, with monsters, with the gear system, is bound up in how the world works and doing things like opening up a chest and then getting teleported to the ass end of, of Ohio, mm -hmm. otherwise known as Kaled in Elden Ring lore, is like uh. that's that's not something that would happen in Shadow of the Colossus, but it somehow hits the right notes. So there's a lot of things that, that they do in Elden Ring that are not just aping Shadow of the Colossus, but work for the same reasons that Shadow of the Colossus' world works. And of course, you also have a staggeringly large selection of excellent boss fights, some of whom are absolutely f off gigantic. <laughs> Do you have to do the climb the outside, stab him in the soft bits, or...? Not that I am aware of. That's the kind of game where you're basically trading hits, gotcha, uh, where it's more yeah. of a typical fight as opposed to Shove the Colossus, which is strictly, you know, a puzzle boss. It's a puzzle platformer yeah. that it tries to kill you. Yeah. yeah. It's it's essentially a lot of the aspects of Shadow of the Colossus minus the puzzle bosses. They're, they're fight bosses. It's mm. it's very much more of a combat game well, than Shadow of the Colossus ever was. Because the Dark Souls combat system is the, yeah. the core of that game that everyone's like, more of this, please. Yeah. So that makes sense. It's a very different experience, but it's leveraged in a way that makes it work. Mm. Elden Ring, good ass game. Nice. The Pathless is a game that is is very consciously uh, in the mold of Shadow of the Colossus, where you are fighting these big, corrupted, evil beasts. But it is not a case of climbing on them to stab them. The open world has much more stuff going on. Not too much more stuff. You don't have like side quests and things. It's it's still all exploring, and there's only so many ways in which you can interact with it. But you are traveling this world to eventually fight the boss. But critically, the big wrinkle that they put into the formula is that the monsters chase you, yeah. which is something the Colossi never do. It's a very different experience, but it's really, really engaging. Well, they chase you out of their designated arena. The Colossi do usually lumber around after you. Yeah, but, but yeah. like it's it's as if you're you're in the open desert uh, by the sky bridge uh, in the north of the map, one. and then it's just like here comes Dirge oh. in the sand after your ass. Oh God. Yeah. So it's it's a very different experience where the the whole world is tinged with this unease. There's never really a moment of calm because a monster could be on your butt at any minute. Also, if I recall correctly, they're almost like followed by this aura, like this weather system. So yeah. you can like feel it encroaching on you. Yeah. Like, oh no, I can tell it's close and I'm going to be in its radius soon. Yeah. It's a bit of an animation trick so they don't have to render the monster being ginormous. It's just a ball that moves around. That's so it's clever. it's a clever little bit of game design, but also it is much more effective than having just the monster because you can see this through the trees. It makes the wind move. It does all this mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a different kind of experience, but it is effectively aligning gameplay and tone so that you really have that that strong hit where everything feels like it works together. It is different from Shadow of the Colossus. I don't think the bosses are as scary when you are actually fighting them. They're much yeah. scarier in the open world, but it still is a great little bit of, of game design, clearly doing its own thing, but learning a lot of really important lessons from Shadow of the Colossus to help make it as good as it can be, which is why I'm really excited for their next game, Sword of the Sea. Come back when I inevitably do one on that. Uh, and then uh, a bit of a Dark Horse entry here, <laughs> Journey. Not a game about fighting giant monsters, but it does what Shadow of the Colossus does, which is the radical simplicity. Mm -hmm. No dialogue, no nonsense. It is clean, it is straightforward, it is doing exactly what it wants to do and not an ounce of fat more. It's using that element of what made Shadow of the Colossus so powerful, where it's just music, tone, imagery, very simple, very straightforward, but all perfectly aligned. 
No giant monsters, but still, I would argue, learning very important lessons from Shadow of the Colossus, even if it wasn't name-dropped as one of their specific yeah. inspirations. Yeah, and it, it does have a few, like, vibes-based similarities, you know? Mm -hmm. Along with, like, the, the music setting the atmosphere extremely well, you also get the feeling like, you're in a place where some shit went down. <laughs> there used yeah. to be a big civilization here. You keep finding all their ruins. Your scarf is backwards compatible with the ancient technology in yeah. the area you're in. And you <laughs> Are these things scarf USB-C? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh uh, man, that's so inconvenient. You know, you get this kind of feeling of like, I'm in a big empty space and I can go wherever I want for the most part, but there's really not a lot out here, which is why it's kind of a rug pull when it's like, is that another me? What the fuck? And then there's another you. Yeah. Another little friend, another online character who just shows up and helps you out. Journey is a very relaxing experience compared to Shadow of the Colossus. Oh, yeah. Like, the vibes of it are like you are, you're just trying to get to the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. That is the entire goal of the game. And they don't need to do, like, any verbal storytelling to tell you that. Yeah. And there's no boss fights, although there are actually giant monsters in that one section of the game. There are oh, like, yeah. No, that's the true. The big, like, yeah. like stingray the searchlight big, things. Yeah. yeah. Stone fish thingy guys. Yeah. And those things kind of kick your ass. Uh, yeah. They're scary. Yeah. Part of that is they are big and fast, and they, they, they're they looking for you, which is part of the dread that you get in parts of Shadow of the Colossus. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of shocking how, like, it goes from, like, beautiful sandy seas and, and a clear view of the mountain to, like, I'm in the dark, I'm trapped with a thing that wants me dead. I hear it before I see it. <laughs> and that is very much the vibe of how every Shadow of the Colossus boss fight, yeah. almost all of them, starts. You know what? Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. I was more right than I knew. Thank yeah. you, Red. You're every welcome. like every other detail diatribe, you 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 pull one of those where it's like, <laughs> I just kind of threw this out here, and you're like, no, 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 you're right. I'm like, what do you know? I am yeah, right. Let him cook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I made this slideshow uh, late last night between the hours of ten o'clock and one thirty in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> This essentially takes us to the question of will we ever get another Shadow of the Colossus? And strictly speaking, no. The games that copy Shadow of the Colossus whole cloth suffer from its same mistakes. And really, th there's no comparison. There's no way to hit the same highs. There was a game called Pray for the Gods that came out a few years ago. That I remember the hype for it, and then I heard nothing it was, about it. It was hyped, and then it was absolutely savaged in the reviews of, like, this is clunky and not as imaginative and just kind of unfortunate. Yeah. And it's like, I, I wanted it to be good, but what else could it have been if it's just following in its footsteps without making choices to be something new and distinct and learn the lessons and make those improvements but then you're having a game that will make those choices to sand off some of those edges and make certain aspects different so yeah. it's impossible to get another shot of the colossus the pro strat is to learn from it remix the ideas in a new context and create something that has the spirit of what made the original game, Shadow of the Colossus, so good, but is still new and distinct, whether that's Zelda or Elden Ring mm -hmm. or God of War or The Pathless or whatever the hell comes next or whatever we haven't even heard of that's been around for years and I've just never seen it. Yeah. It's it's not a case of, of just making another Shadow of the Colossus. We have Shadow of the Colossus. We're so lucky to have the remake from 2018. It's amazing and you owe it to yourself to go play it and enjoy it if you have a PlayStation. Frankly, if you're on the fence, this game I think makes getting one worth it. Mm. it it's it's better than just having another one of a game we already have. It's keeping the dream alive by making something new for the new moment, for the new sensibilities that we as players have. It's cool to have this relic that is still so good today. We can appreciate what it did well, we can learn from what it didn't, but we'd be silly to try and just copy it. Yeah, I mean, people have tried to, like, I, I'm at this point very curious about Pray for the Gods, because, like, when it got announced, I remember people were like, it's going to be like Shadow of the Colossus. And like, we've gotten all these games inspired by parts of Shadow of the Colossus, mm -hmm. but I really want more of the like, truly massive boss monster that you have to navigate like it is a puzzle platformer level unto itself. Mm -hmm. And it's not happy that you're there. Like that is one, I think that's the trickiest part of Shadow of the Colossus to strike that balance. Cause like vibes based storytelling, a lot of games have pulled that off. The the feeling of like, I shouldn't be here. That's something that a lot of games can do. But like the one part of Breath of the Wild that did not capture the Shadow of the Colossus feeling was the giant monsters. And they, they didn't yeah. do that at all in Tears of the Kingdom. The, the dungeon bosses, they, they sort of just shrink down to the one attack you need to mash to kill it. And really that's how a lot of dungeon, uh, a lot of final bosses work because it's like Dark Beast Ganon is a giant monster. 
What do you do? You ride a circle around it, you shoot him in the glowy weak points. That is it. Dark Beast Ganon is huge, but in a way that basically doesn't matter. Colgara is huge, but the way you defeat it is either shoot or dive bomb through its three weak points twice, and then you're fine. That's it. And, you know, all these bosses, they have such cool designs, they have such cool vibes, good music, but ultimately, it just becomes, I figured out how to beat it, I will mash that button until I do. The thing that makes the Colossi feel so memorable feels like they aren't like, oh, this thing's a punchline, like, oh, this guy's pyrophobic, whatever, is that they still f*** you over even after you figure out how to yeah. beat them. Like, that's the part that you remember. And that's the, the edge that gets sanded off of every adaptation. So you get big monsters, but beating them essentially just feels like quick time events. Mm -hmm. And quick time events aren't memorable. Like, we, we no. did one of the God of War games, like, we fought Gaia or something early on. That would have been three. Yeah, and she was, like, really big, but come on. There's nothing there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The thing that I wanted when we were playing Shadow of the Colossus, uh, my, my Nintendo brain was spoiled. <laughs> I was like, I want to be able to climb everything and paraglide down. Let me do it. And I'm just, like, really curious how Shadow of the Colossus would play if every wall was climbable and every part of the Colossus was, like sort of climbable, but they could also, like, smack you wherever. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. I, I'm not saying this would be a good game. It's just, that's what I was thinking. And that's that's the part of Shadow of the Colossus that I have never seen a game successfully replicate. And I I, I would want to see that. Like, we were joking about, like, release the 48 Colossus's cut, because they had <laughs> so many, like, draft colossi. 24 made it to the design stage. Uh -huh. uh, the original 48 was like, oh, wouldn't it be great if yeah. um, they're on, like, wikis and stuff. There's, there's eight other ones mm -hmm. that were at least partially concepted or prototypes were built. Yeah. It but would be cool to see them. It would be really cool yeah. to see them. It's like, I know that I am the basic fan who the, the, who's like, I want more of the thing that I liked. Just yeah. more of the thing. Shadow of the Colossus DLC, put in the giant spider. I don't care. But like, I think that the lessons to be learned from Shadow of the Colossus are so interesting. And the reason why, yeah. thesis of the slide, we will never get another Shadow of the Colossus is because there will never be another first time this game has ever happened. Yep. Like, you can make Shadow of the Colossus again, and it will have all the same problems as the original Shadow of the Colossus, and none of the knock-your-socks-off power of, like, video games can do that? Yeah. In 2005? Yeah. Yeah. You're playing catch-up with a 20-year-old game. In the same it's... way that when Tears of the Kingdom came out, all the things that people were impressed by in Breath of the Wild, like, they just didn't give Tears of the Kingdom any credit for those. Yeah, it's like, exactly. oh, it's open world, whatever, traversal mechanics. Pfft. And it's like, yeah. this game is still fucking really it's good, really guys. Good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the question of all adaptation is when you're making another version of something in a new medium, or in this case, adapting ideas from one game into another one, mm -hmm. how do you adapt that? What do you choose to keep? What do you choose to change? What do you adjust for a new medium? It's a tricky thing, but it's a process that rewards creativity. And the games that we talked about that do this well are some of the best games from the last 15 years. Yeah. So it's a worthwhile process. So even though we will never get another shot of the Colossus, it would be a tragedy to stop trying. Nice. There's the thesis, which hey you you pointed to this very early in the presentation, so you were like, yeah, you know, it's important that people keep trying. I'm like, uh-huh, yeah, I wouldn't know anything about that. Um, and yeah. that's uh, that's essentially my, my piece on this. Uh, the thesis that we finally figured out after many hours of, well, of uh, <laughs> uh, going back and forth uh, while playing the game. I mean, a little bit of inside baseball, all of our early theses were like, this game is so good. Here's a way that it's good. I, I thought it was interesting how, like, Wander is like a blank slate mirror to, like, all kinds of game protagonists. And I thought that was really interesting, the fact that this is like a fucked up and evil hero's journey. I, there's a lot to be said about things like there's not a single comprehensible word in the game. It's all yeah. subtitles. They use, like, a, a... It's not a conlang, but, like, they, they use a language that is not a language. So yeah. It's Japanese that's heavily romanized, which is interesting. Right, which means that it's essentially incomprehensible. Yeah. And th you end up with this world that feels very alien. Like, you don't have full context for it. And Wander is not looking into it. Mm -hmm. So you just end he up... He doesn't care. He doesn't care. <laughs> so you just end up feeling very outside of it, but also extremely immersed in the world through Wander. There's, there's so many things that are really good about this game but we hit like a gauntlet of three colossi in a row that were huge pains in the ass <laughs> it's like, wait and i a was minute. like should we should we dunk a little bit <laughs> like, <laughs> can is we is that allowed <laughs> like everyone was like game is a and the weird thing is i was looking up like the, the reviews that came out when this game first came out and, like the, the scores mm -hmm. and it was like a lot of like nine out of tens eight and a half out of tens a few ten out of tens everyone's like this is proof that games can be art this is a, a beautiful experience. Controls are kind of dog shit. Seven and a half out of ten. And I was like, I, 
and when I was reading through it, I was like, oh, how dare you? This game is a masterpiece. And then as I was playing it, I was like, mm, wait, wait, actually, <laughs> hmm. <Yeah. laughs> and like, like we've played this game before and I was like, Dirge is kicking my ass. This is terrifying. Ah! But I always kind of was kind of like, you know, I bet if I just got good, this wouldn't bother me. And it's like, <laughs> I am good. And this still <laughs> bothers, still bothers me. me. And like, it's fun to talk about. And one of the things that I really like about this game that I really respect is that Team Eco committed to the bit of yeah. we are going to make foundational mechanics in our games reliant on nuanced AI that does not do what the player wants it to do. Like with Trico, they were like, we could have made it so that he comes whenever your character calls, but we didn't do that. And I was like, cool, awesome. But like, <laughs> they they committed, they had an idea and they iterated on it over the course of three games and they were like, cool, we, we learned something. Shadow of the Colossus is not a perfect game. Were we attempting to title it in a certain way, we could call it a flawed masterpiece yeah. <laughs> or something like that. Ain't every game. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, there are good things that are good about it and things that aren't, as if that does not apply to everything ever created. Yeah, it's the way they're tied together that really makes it. Yeah, and the fact that Shadow of the Colossus was part two of three, essentially, the middle installment of iterating on that process, the apotheosis of which was Trico, and everyone was like, okay, little much. Like, we learned something from that. And yeah. it, was, it was because these people tried something that wasn't guaranteed to work, and they continued trying it even when it didn't fully work. Yeah. And you ended up producing a game that is not perfect, as if that phrase means anything at all, yeah. but really, really good that people are still trying to study and pick apart and understand. They tried a new thing, and even when it didn't fully work, they, they committed and they, they tried it more, and it produced a game that people are still trying to figure out how to replicate that, that special sauce from. It happened because they didn't just do what other games had done before. Like, ironically, you know, everyone's trying to study Shadow of the Colossus, figure out how to do more Shadow of the Colossus, when Shadow of the Colossus is the way it is because it was not trying to be more of another game. Yeah, it was trying to be less of every other game. <laughs> right, it, was, it did something kind of completely different, yeah. and it worked, and... That's why I think it is always so important to have games like this that will just try new sh even if it will be the thing that knocks them down from a 10 out yeah. of 10 to an 8.5. And, a half. and it, it results in a game that is so viscerally evocative that you can go to a concert with some of your favorite game soundtracks of all time and you hear this one and think, I need to go home and play that right now. Yeah, right and now. And that is, that is the mark of a, a strong-ass game. So, uh, uh bye! bye. <laughs>